Good afternoon to our audience in Europe and um, top of the morning to our participants from the United States. I'm del delighted to welcome everyone to this online policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center to discuss about the state of affairs in Northern Kosovo and about the prospects of diffusing tensions between Serbia and Kosovo, not just for the sake of dealing with the most uh, recent um, disquieting episode between the two sides, but also as a means of settling once and for all their long-standing dispute. The process of normalizing relations between Belgrade and Pristina under the EU's mediation has been ongoing uh, for more than a decade now, conditioning the two parties' efforts to advance towards the EU, blocking regional economic cooperation, and testing also the credibility of the approach adopted by the Union and the United States towards the region. With war still raging on Europe's border, instability and violence in the Balkans cannot be taken lightly. But where are things standing at present? What are the real risks? How did we get here? And where do we go from here? These are some of the key questions that our distinguished panelists will address today, helping us to make sense of the situation. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Donika Emini, Director at Civicos Platform and member of the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group, Edward Joseph, Senior Fellow and Lecturer at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Augustin Pakolai, welcome Augustin, Senior Correspondent for um, Hansa Media, and Jovana Spremo, Advocacy Director at Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Thank you to all of you so much for agreeing to speak here today. As ever, we will first hear from our panelists and then I will open the floor for questions and comments from our participants. All of you in the audience um, are welcome and I would say even encouraged to send us your written questions at any time during the meeting. Uh, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens for that. Alternatively, you can press, uh, press the um, uh, raise your hand button and wait for me to allow you uh, to intervene live when the time comes. And with that, let's get started. Donika, from the perspective of Kosovo, how do you explain developments in northern Kosovo uh, over the past few months? Um, and how would you describe the situation at present? Um, good afternoon. I'm joining from South Albania, so it explains my <laughs> my background, uh, trying to sort of disguise, although it's, it's beautiful out there. Um, I'm very happy to join you, and unfortunately, we are organizing the second panel that is about Northern Kosovo and the problems in there. Just a few months ago, we were talking about the elections there and how the situation went without knowing what it is going to lead, which unfortunately led to yet another crisis. I'm happy to, to join, of course, Ed, Augustin, and Jovana here. Um, unfortunately, when we talk about the northern part of Kosovo, it's, it's a mistake to actually focus only on what happened in, in, the, uh, in the past months, because, well, this is a result, this is a trigger event, this is yet another crisis that explains way much more, explains the fact that we not only failed in 2013 to actually implement the Brussels Agreement and really push towards normalization back then, but we made the same mistake, and by we, I mean, you know, Kosovo, Serbia, but also EU and the US, believing that they can repeat the same exercise in 2023 with Brussels arrangement. This is how I call it because it's not signed. Uh, and uh, and then immediately in uh, Actually in Ohrid, we saw this coming. We saw that this problem is going to happen. And uh, we, we are going to, uh, I mean, uh, on differently what, uh, from what Borrell has said, uh, that the EU is leaving this conflict management cycle and they are finally taking the lead and, and working on normalization, this didn't work because the Ohri document was a document which really was vague. You could see that the parties after Brussels arrangement, they couldn't agree on anything but a donor uh, conference 
uh, which is now, I think, on hold at the moment. I'm not sure about it. But all the rest did not have deadlines. They, 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 they were clearly, you know, lacking this implementing uh, action plan, which we needed desperately. Uh, Brussels arrangement was a good turn turning point, a solid tur turning point, but without any teeth or diplomatic capital to actually make it happen in a way. It just was ambiguous. It can, it, it showed that the EU still wanted to uh, invest a lot of effort in this incrementalism, which obviously did not work. It was actually very problematic in the last panel we had with CPC, we discussed about the elections that, you know, in Ohrid, they didn't discuss about, you know, the elections in the north and whether, you know, the Serbian citizens would actually uh, participate or was there any promise by Joseph Borrell made to Albin Kurti that the Serbs will participate and ended up not participating in the end. So fast forward, we have a situation in which was obviously terrible. I mean, it, it wasn't, it's not just politically a situation that clearly makes it very difficult to bounce back uh, to what it was before. I'm not even, you know, talking about normalization now. It's just talking about a, a situation in which we can actually have a diplomatic sort of, you know, process that lead, leads to negotiating, let alone to, to, to continue with normalization. But we also had K4 soldiers being wounded in Kosovo, something that didn't happen in, in, in the early 2000s when K4 deployed in Kosovo. And it was a very, very blurry situation back then. So we are having now a situation in which the, 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 the entire future of northern part of Kosovo, it's a big question mark. Uh, now, clearly, there is some sort of, you know, arrangement between Bislimi, Beslik Bislimi, the deputy prime minister of Kosovo with Miroslav Lajcik. There is this four point plan because we until now we have developed more than 20 points back and forth. So there is a, you know, a plan which foresees Kosovo to withdraw police forces from the north and then pave the way for the new elections. But it only takes one step to not work and then the situation to escalate back to what we saw. Uh, a month ago. Um, and this is what happened also with, with Brussels. We talked about this, Corina. We were in Austria. We were discussing the problems of this arrangement. And all of us agree that it is only about the time and our leaders are praying or hoping that the other one is going to violate it in one way or another. So we wouldn't have to implement it and they wouldn't have to actually commit diplomatically to it. So this is the problem. The problem is that with all the diplomatic engagement of the US and EU, and here we have Augustine, we have Ed, they will talk about it, which was the maximum. They even you know, threatened with sanctions. Kosovo ended up being sanctioned. Still, with all the leverage that the EU and US could use, we, we ended up having a very, very dusty document, which led to a more catastrophic situation on the ground. So now it's a turning point. We will talk about it later. Uh, but, you know, now it's summer and obviously not a lot will happen. But in September, we'll have to deal with all of this. Uh, we'll have to deal with the fact that if we organize new elections, whether the Serbs will be there and how is the future going to look like? Because let me tell you, you think elections are a problem? The actual challenge is establishing the association. And that is where, you know, the situation on the ground might again change. And not only between Kosovo and Serbia, but also within Kosovo, because obviously Kurti will deal with a lot of issues internally uh, doing, by, by doing, you know, establishing the association, the only element of the Brussels dialogue that he uh, rejected uh, for so long, and he still does not know what to do with it entirely. Donika, do you do, do you think um, that um, Kurti has played his hand wrongly? Uh, do you agree with those who say say that um, he lost northern Kosovo? He... Well, I mean, clearly there is um, there is a lot that can be done. So again, I say this hoping that you know we will go back to actually trying to integrate that part of Kosovo. In terms of what I think about the north, I think that. Unfortunately, not with Kurti, 2018, when Thaci and Vucic launched the idea of land swap. I think that's when 
the actual integration that had happened since 2013 with the Brussels agreement was, you know, started to shatter. It was back then when, you know, the Serbs had been told from 2013 to 2018 that you have to integrate. This is a police, this is the institutions, this is a judicial system. You have it all, you will do it all. And then all of a sudden there was the idea of land swap, which kind of, you know, sort of flirted the idea of you, maybe you can, you know, just join Serbia territorially. So I think it started back then that it, to shatter and then from then if you look at how the you know the situation in the north you know has uh, happened and, and and you know like all the tensions i think every step every time there were tension we sort of departed one step from one another and now the gap is so huge that it is almost impossible to think that you know we can actually go back to what it was after you know 2013 the status we are back to the status quo of pre 2012 mm -hmm. which definitely wasn't good there is you know this resentment of local serbs towards skurti and this was of course you know triggered by many interventions in the north i wouldn't expect kurti to engage in Thas in Thachi's sort of game uh, to create tensions in the north in order to gradually you know like extend uh, authority uh, authority in the north because uh, i believe that kurti and I strongly believed in Kurtis and Osmani's idea that we we are progressive and we are going to talk to local Serbs. We are talking to people. We are going to economically integrate the North rather than you know just look at it from you know political perspective. Although uh, it is very difficult. Uh, part of Kosovo to navigate because obviously in the north there is also very strong Serbian presence because if you look at the boycott but if you look at how also Lista Srpska but uh, navigates around Vucic and, and Belgrade you can clearly see that this is way much complicated than Kurti thought in the beginning so now yes I believe that it's unfortunately more detached and a lot of work has to be done in order to make sure that we at least normalize the situation and start to integrate people in, right. in the north. Thank you so much, Donika. Uh, you mentioned Serbia, so I come to Jovana um, to ask her what has been going on in northern Kosovo from your perspective? How far apart, if at all, is the Serbian reading of the events um, from, from what Donika presented? Well, uh... Usually, Donika and I have a, a, the similar view on the on on the situation um, in the field, and uh, this will not be much different. Um, so uh, I will try to to present how it actually looks like from from the Belgrade perspective. But um, I have to say that the developments in the north, uh, well, were not did not happen all of a sudden. So it was highly expected that there will be some sort of um, escalation of the situation. And uh, I see two biggest issues here. And this is one on one side, this will be the um, accumulation of frustration in the North, firstly, uh, especially um, after the, the uh, acquittal of the people from the, from the inter integrated uh, judiciary and police which resulted in a in higher amount of the special um, uh, units of the Kosovo police um, in the north. Then um, yet again, we had uh, the issue of the expropriation, which was also raised uh, by the, by the uh, North Kosovo Serbs um, as an issue. So, and in the end, we had the elections, which were where, where the Serbs did not participate and uh, of course, uh, when there was a moment for the elected representatives to to obtain the office to take the office, um, this is where um, the the let's say where we reached the highest um, uh, point of the of that frustration. The other issue that uh, where I see the role of Belgrade actually is that at the same time. Um, it, at the end of May, beginning of June, we had uh, the biggest, let's say, the rise of the protests um, in Belgrade, uh, resulting from the tragedies that we uh, dealt with in the beginning of the May. And it was probably one of the uh, most important political, um, um, let's say, happenings in, in Serbia, especially uh, when it comes uh, to the to, to government percept perceptive that something is affecting the this um, authoritative 
rule ruling um, of uh, of the Serbian Progressive Party. So as we are used to, like we were all expecting something to happen in connection to the Kosovo, because whenever we have a, a big rule of law situation or human rights uh, situation that has to be dealt with within the country, we have the situation in Kosovo. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not a political analyst. I'm mostly the policy analyst. So um, in my view, uh, I think there were controllable uh, elements regarding the, the escalation of the situation and incontrollable elements. Uh, Donika mentioned the Srpska lista and, and uh, the regular way of protesting, which, is, um, which usually happens in the north, the barricades, the, the protests uh, in front of the institutions. Uh, but I, I do believe that there were groups which were um, well, not entirely um, controlled by Belgrade, and I think this resulted uh, in the in the um, in the fact that there were K4 uh, soldiers attacked, because I do not see Belgrade playing this much with the um, with the with the situation, because everything was going um, on their hand. Let's say because of the Kurtis. Um, dealing with the situation because not moving um, anywhere, uh, not, not responding to, to the requests of, of um, uh, Kosovo Serbs at that point. So um, I wouldn't say that Belgrade would play that much uh, to say that this was a um, highly controlled uh, event uh, by Belgrade. On the other side, I want to... Uh to yeah. <laughs> Uh, who who were who was there then? Uh, where were the, the, these groups coming from then? I have no idea. I mean, for me personally, I'm not following the security issues. Like we are monitoring mostly the rule of law issues and the access to justice. So uh, at this point, the only thing that I uh, that the Belgrade perception uh, can be seen is that that there were controlled by there were some controlling by belgrade because we knew that this it is a sort of response to the protests happening in belgrade but uh the the escalation of the situation showed actually that um this was not even something that Vucic could control from belgrade so uh, when it comes to political control under the serbska lista this is something that no one is actually um, um doubting anymore uh, but I do think that this was uh, a, a local, like purely local response to the to the frustration that was happening in the uh, few previous months, like from the license plates, from the presence of uh, uh, special police uh, forces, from the expropriation, etc. Not having the representation in the integrated institutions anymore. I personally believe that leaving the integrated institutions was the biggest mistake for, for Serbian uh, community in the North because um, our researchers actually showed that the level of access to justice, although it was um, like it, it was not on a good level, but it was improved sort of with the integration of, of judiciary. And there were some trust by the by the Serbian citizens in the institutions. Now we don't have that. Now we just have a, a let's say, group of people who is uh, left with no uh, institutions that they trust to actually address. Um, I would I would like to actually mention the the perception of the Ohrid um, deal and Ohrid agreement in Serbia. As you all know, it was presented like nothing is signed, um, nothing is obligatory for us. Uh, and uh, speaking with uh, with your EU officials is actually actually we got um, very much convinced that uh, the uh, it is pretty much a legally binding um, agreement, especially because uh, the articles of the of the Ohrid deal will actually be transposed into the Serbia's chapter thirty five, uh, which deals with the normalization of Belgrade and Pristina which means that we will have a total revision of the benchmarks dealing with the, um, with the uh, relations of Belgrade and Pristina. Previously, it was mirroring sort of the Brussels agreement. Now it will actually mirror the, this deal and it will have um, an 
let's say action points mm -hmm. um, to the um, to the benchmarks. On the other side, Kosovo framework will also be adopted, and uh, the the parts of the agreements will be uh, transposed uh, into this framework, which means by having agreements with the EU, we basically uh, accept that this agreement also becomes uh, a part of this um, EU negotiating framework. Uh, the element um, that was actually missing in the Brussels agreement, which I personally see with all the developments as clinically dead now, uh, is actually the reconciliation element. And um, we, we, what we saw in these 10 years, wherever there were actually steps towards the normalization, we had the political crisis, which uh, led us back to the undealt um, issues with the past. So uh, with the understanding that um, the reconciliation and dealing with the past is always burdening any other deal and any other way of, of um, uh, making the agreements on the other issues, somehow we always see that with, with if we are not dealing with the past, if we are not working on the reconciliation, we, on the, um, um, let's say, uh, symbolical gestures by both sides, we cannot actually achieve the normalization as we tend to. Right. I want to come back to that um, and, and see how that reconciliation can be achieved. But before, uh, let's go to Augustine. Um, and what I'd like to ask you is what you can tell us about the, the, the role and the reaction of the EU in this crisis. I mean, we've heard from the previous speakers that, well, this was highly expected. Was it, it was highly expected. So how prepared was then the EU to handle it and how did it do in practice? You hear me now? Yeah, uh, I think uh, if you go back and uh, remember what you was saying, it was not only accept, expected, but also announced because uh, even Leitchak said that we will have either uh, progress in the dialogue or uh, tensions and uh, uh, conflict. So uh, basically, uh, I don't know how much this is linked uh, to the dialogue because uh, uh, dialogue impacts the situation on the ground and situation on the ground uh, is created in order to impact the dialogue. But uh, uh, my opinion following this dialogue for from the very beginning, so for 12 years is that EU is lost in the dialogue. Uh, we don't know whether there is agreement, first of all. I mean, more times uh, go by and uh, more we analyze uh, the statements of the parties, we uh, question whether uh, EU was uh, right or it was uh, misleading, uh, claiming that uh, there is an agreement. Uh, the aim of EU at the beginning, going back over three years when Leitchak was appointed, was to achieve within a month, not a year, so a comprehensive legally binding uh, uh, agreement that will resolve all, all outstanding uh, issues between the parties. So what uh, we have uh, is something that we don't know whether it is agreement. It is not signed. We don't know whether it was agreed. Uh, and uh, uh, we have implementation plan that is about implementation of something that we don't know that really exists. So whenever we ask the European Union uh, about the topics on the agenda, like tomorrow there will be a meeting, another meeting, another attempt to go, I would call it back to the future, like going back to the dialogue uh, and trying to normalize the dialogue now because the, we are far from normalization. They say that uh, everything is on the agenda that is uh, accept, acceptable by both sides. So formally association was never on the agenda because Kosovo refused to discuss it. So if we have one party saying that we didn't sign, we didn't agree, we didn't endorse, we didn't accept the agreement, we cannot claim that there is agreement. And I'm not uh, quoting an analyst or journalist or something. I'm quoting here President of Serbia, Alexander Vucic. I asked him clearly because he clearly insists that Kosovo should implement uh, what he calls community 
of Serb municipalities uh, because Kosovo signed it. And when I asked him why does he deliberately make a difference between signing and accepting, he said that uh, he didn't accept any agreement. And he even turned to a professor of uh, a lawyer who was with this to confirm that he is right. He said that I only accepted a concept of normalization. He calls it a concept of normalization from which we will implement some things, but some things we will not. And we made clear to European Union what are our red lines. After this, still EU insists that there is agreement and it is legally binding by both sides. So uh, I don't agree with uh, Jovana that uh, it's legally binding. First of all, uh, accession negotiations are not legally binding. So uh, who, who can confirm that Serbia wants to join European Union? Uh, second, uh, chapter 34 anyway has this suspension clause. So whatever uh, is linked to the normalization is there. So it was not clearly defined, but the lack of progress on normalization can be used to suspend accession negotiation with Serbia anytime on any chapter. This was even before. It will, of course, be enforced by putting implementation of this whatever it is, agreement or concept or whatever, but it will not change much. Second, we know that Serbia is far, far from progress in the uh, accession negotiations, and it's not related to Kosovo. By the way, I deeply think that uh, 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 the lack of progress of Serbia in accession talks is much more linked to the relations with Russia than to Kosovo, because Serbia was never uh, uh, how to say, never criticized about the uh, lack of progress in relations with Kosovo. While it is blocked completely, uh, no, no chapters, no uh, uh, blocks are open uh, because of uh, the refusal of Serbia to support sanctions on Russia. So, and just look what the uh, EU was answering when we asked um, they call it a Brussels agreement of the 27th of February. Uh, if you, you can go back to the archive of European External Action Service, and the statement of Borrell was not that they agreed, but it's that both parties agreed that there is no need to discuss further. So in all languages, this can mean everything. It can mean that who cares about that? And Vucic was saying, I don't care what the others are saying. So uh, uh, I think that it was over-optimistic to claim that this was uh, agreed and to sell it to member states, trying that through the support of the leaders of 27 member states, uh, uh, increase the political leverage and pressure on the parties. So uh, they often say that, look, you have all 27 of the leaders, United States plus, so you should take it seriously. And unfortunately, they are not taking it seriously. But I think that the EU also has a responsibility here because it went too far in improvising, uh, like imp improvising first about the signature. A very senior EU official, because of the rules that we have to communicate with them, I cannot mention the name, said to us that uh, without the signature, agreement is just a political statement. It doesn't mean much. So we, there has to be agreement. That it has to be signed. Mm -hmm. After Serbia refused to sign, they said, well, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, matter. Uh, it has to be signed together with implementation plan because agreement as such without implementation plan is not important, but we have to have full package. So both agreement and implementation plan. Should it be uh, 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 signed? Yes, of course, it has to be signed. And then it was not signed. Now they were they, they went up saying, look, why are you bothering us with the questions? You know, let's not focus whether it's signed or not. It is an ob obligation for the parties to implement. Mm -hmm. But uh, we saw that uh, the parties didn't uh, uh, take it uh, that way. So this brought us to the situation where we are now. I mean, the agreement, if it existed, is dead. Mm -hmm. tomorrow, tomorrow there will be an attempt to uh, revive it, to start it again. Mm -hmm. So whether EU and United States will, will have a will to push for it, and uh, I should say the pressure should be on Serbia, because Serbia's president said, even ridiculing, saying that I had the pain in my right arm so I couldn't sign. Uh, so uh, uh, they have to be serious. 
Another thing is that we saw that unprecedented uh, willingness, uh, determination and speed to sanction Kosovo. So uh, while still uh, refusing uh, to say publicly whether they blame Serbia on anything. They, uh, uh, and the sanctions against Kosovo uh, has to do more with the security situation. And uh, you asked Donika whether Kurti uh, made the wrong step. I would say that, uh, you know, you have in basketball, whoever plays basketball, when you go in to score, you have a right to have a th two steps. And on the third step, you uh, you you uh, shoot uh, the ball. If you do uh, one more step, it's uh, uh, a misstep. So he he did too many steps. I think that uh, 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 the problem was in relations to United States. So he didn't coordinate mm -hmm. and uh, 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 here we heard many times from Kosovo government that we are coordinating with our uh, partners. So this was a proof that this was never, it was not true. Because if you have United States, EU, EU Germany, UK and others saying publicly that there was no coordination. So you cannot claim that maybe behind the door they have coordination. I don't think that they function like that. So uh, because it was a security issue at that moment, in that place, United States didn't want Kosovo special police to go. So this is uh, what I think uh, irritated United States. And when United States were uh, ready to sanction Kosovo, then EU was more than ready because uh, whenever United States is part in the dialogue in any way, it's there to pressure Kosovo, not to pressure Serbia because US doesn't want to pressure Serbia, even if they want, I don't think that they, they can have any, they can have big impact on, on Belgrade because since Kosovo declared independence, EU, US supported, they have this policy with Belgrade that we agree to disagree on Kosovo and then we go on to have uh, uh, better relations. But uh, uh, what we have now is how to save now this, agreement to make yeah. it a real but agreement. I, I, and I, will come, I will come back to, to, to all of you with the question about uh, what to do next. Perhaps one very quick, um, uh, if you would, follow up question. Do you think that uh, now the, uh, the recent US sanctions against Vulin could signal that, that, that there is a change with respect to uh, US policy towards, uh, towards Serbia? No, I don't think because the uh, U.S. Uh, has this selective approach. They were critical towards behavior of Vulin anyway, but they pretend that uh, Vucic uh, is different and uh, he doesn't have influence and so on. So it's, uh, uh, I don't think, I mean, it can have impact in sense of uh, cooperation of the security services, uh, even of security services of European Union with Serbia, which is very serious because there are, many many issues from organized crime uh, uh, people smuggling and so on that they need to cooperate this might impact it can impact also a little bit approach towards situation in the north because there is cooperation and coordination also between nato and serbia on, at the military level yeah. uh, the, i i don't know whether this has to do with the kidnapping or arrest of the kosovo police by by serbia if this is an issue then it can have impact because uh, uh, I, I'm far, I'm not there. I've been in North many times, speak to the Serbs and so on, but I'm still in Brussels, so I don't give sure. myself a right to, to, to be sure. But I'm pretty sure that a lot of things in the North are orchestrated and uh, well, well coordinated by uh, all sides because uh, uh, there, is a lot, there are a lot of tensions, but uh, unfortunately for them, only casualties are from K4 and the journalists. There are no other uh, casualty. Right. So it looks pretty, pretty controlled. Right. Thank you so much, Augustine. Um, EU is lost. There was poor uh, coordination with the United States. Edward, I come to you. So what about the United States? How, how do you assess the increased American involvement in the region over the past years? And, and also more specifically, its response now to, um, to the escalation of problems we've, we've been witnessing? Thank you very much, uh, Karina, and great to be with you and uh, my fellow, fellow panelists here today. And I'm listening very closely to what they have to say. Let, let me just uh, quickly say that the, the one uh, group not represented here, and I was very pleased to meet with them yesterday, is of course, Kosovo Serbs from the North. And I uh, met with some yesterday. I also, I was in the North myself uh, again 
last month uh, in the wake of the tensions there and uh, had some good uh, conversations with folks there. And I would point out uh, that I used to live in the North uh, back in uh, 99, 2000, 2001. Uh, there in uh, in Mitrovica in the north, and uh, as a deputy head of the Koso of the OSC mission in Kosovo, we went through a very similar experience in 2011, which saw the first use of barricades and also saw K4 attacked, uh, shot actually shot and wounded uh, in that period, and this was a, went on for months uh, in 2011. So. Uh, and, and I do understand the concerns, and unfortunately, Kosovo Serbs are, are really caught in the middle here and are the unfortunate pawns here. And I think it's very important, Corinna, let me just, before we dive into the U.S. and what it's doing and, the, uh, and its relationship uh, with the EU and with uh, both Kosovo and Serbia, let's just take one step back. This is very important. This is what I've been writing about, I, I, I wrote about this in a recent article in Foreign Policy that uh, they entitled how the United States is uh, creating a Kosovo crisis, which is that why this problem exists at all, why this standoff I I even is here. And everyone will go back to history and the Battle of Kosovo and so forth, and that's not the reason. Uh, these are, of course, difficult, emotional issues. We know that in the Balkans, but we've also seen in the Balkans, these issues have been overcome. Longstanding, even very bitter issues over history have been overcome. So why has it been that uh, the United States and EU with all their leverage and influence have not been able to uh, address this Kosovo uh, issue? And the, the reason is very clear in, in my view, and I've been writing about this and I've co-written about this, I, I would emphasize with people from the region. And that's because of the position of within the EU itself, the divisions within the EU itself. And I just need to emphasize that, that this, in other words, this is an artificially protracted problem because you do not have the basis for a normal negotiation. Uh, because one party is privileged, one party, and I, it's better to even use that term rather than you naming them. One party, if you look at this as a negotiation between party X and party Y, let's leave out the names, let's leave out all the baggage. If party X is privileged, if, if uh, four uh, NATO countries, five EU countries say, we won't uh, recognize Y until X party X does, well, then you've just handed party X uh, a, a huge uh, leverage and you've removed from party X any interest in resolving the dispute. And, and so this, this is what hovers over this. And so when we see the difficulties that uh, Kosovo Serbs are under here, and we know that uh, there are real pressures, provocations, that even in Kosovo, the opposition points out and says, and blames the Kurti government for uh, uh, provocations and for uh, ignoring and defying the U.S. and the EU on the north, uh, we we know that there's a larger reason for this, and and that's the problem, and that's what what uh, makes this so difficult because the EU itself is divided, and I would point out here, of course, you have that in the person of uh, the two negotiators, Josip Borrell and Miroslav Lychak, who both are former foreign ministers from two non-recognizing countries, of course, which is Spain and Slovakia. The other two are uh, Romania and Greece. And, and as I've written, it, we don't, Cyprus is irrelevant here because uh, with four, recognition from four, uh, Kosovo would have a path to NATO. That's all it needs. That would then bring the two parties, instead of X and Y, I'll say their names now, Serbia and Kosovo, into uh, a, a position where each side are, are, have um, uh, an equal playing field there for negotiation. And, and then you would have the basis for doing what has been done elsewhere in the region. And then uh, you could have what I call a dignified and stabilizing settlement. So that point should never be forgotten. So when everyone's, oh, it's so difficult, it's so hard. Yes, it's because of that 
And that, um, even this Brussels uh, Ohrid agreement, you can call, we could call agreement or not, uh, was meant to address in some way, but doesn't really, because there's no commitment from any of those four countries that even if it's fully implemented, even if uh, Kosovo were to implement the association to the, to the uh, greatest degree and Serbia were to uh, uh, do uh, fulfill its own obligations there with respect to documents and exchange of missions and so forth, there's no guarantee that, uh, that, that those four would change their position. Greece probably would, but the other three and certainly Spain, uh, it's up in the air. And so that's, we have to always remember that here you know, when, we, when we say, gee, it's so complicated and it's so difficult that it's artificially so. So that's uh, some reason, and I have, have a, a, approaches on that we won't discuss today, but uh, ironically, Ukraine's recognition of Kosovo could, could address this. But we, let's turn now to your question of the role of the US. I was very glad that you um, just asked uh, about Augustine, about uh, Vulin. Uh, let me let me say and give here turn from the very difficult and, and sort of the, the very intractable problems and we know that they are and, and people are very pessimistic and I heard that yesterday and, and they're right to be so and their people are right to be concerned. But I'm gonna give you one point of optimism here before we, we get into anything else. One point of optimism uh, or encouragement at least is that within Kosovo, and within Serbia, and we heard Jovana allude to this, and we heard uh, Donika allude to this, that within those polities within Kosovo and Serbia, there is almost no criticism of the positions of the US and EU. So you do not have in Kosovo a lot of criticism of the, uh, uh, across the opposition. You do not have people saying, oh, this is so unfair, uh, why, why are these sanctions? You, you're, you're punishing Kosovo, you do nothing on Serbia. Why are you doing? No, the opposition is united in Kosovo and, and blaming Porti for the, uh, damaging the relationship. And even I would say calling him out on ex excesses towards Kosovo Serbs. I've heard that in civil society as well. And that under, undergoes this. And in Serbia, look at the, re look at the reaction to Vulin. Who is supporting Vulin? Do you see, uh, all sorts of outpouring. Oh, this is attack on Serbian nation. No, you don't see that. I, what I've read, proposition is they're glad this has happened. They see uh, Vulin as a representative of, of criminality, of the, the protests that, that Jovana was talking about. So this is, to me, is a source of encouragement. This means that uh, the US and EU are not completely powerless here. Um, and, and so, and, and in my view, uh, actually, I, I believe that the Vulin uh, sanctions are quite significant. I would use the word remarkable. It's remarkable because uh, uh, this was always the, the, the borderline, uh, the whole policy towards Vucic. No, 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 we can't touch him. Oh gosh, we need him, you know, with Russia, we need him on Kosovo. And ironically, it's Kosovo that, by the way, that links uh, Serbia and Russia. It's not uh, these other distractions. But uh, we see that line has now been crossed. I call this the fear factor. The fear factor has now been crossed. That's the precedent here. And this is, I, I believe, a very significant message. Now, will U.S. diplomacy in the, in the person of the U.S. ambassador there, will they actually pursue this and hold take the opportunity here to hold Vucic accountable, that remains to be seen. But this was a high level decision in Washington that right. was done. And I know this was done after uh, serious consultations about the situation. Uh, I, I know that uh, an article in foreign policy was discussed as part of this. And so I do think it's significant. Finally, uh, Corinna, let's just talk about the tactical and the management here of the US and the EU. The US, of course, its whole posture is we are with the EU 100% in this tight coordination. And uh, this is the, the problem, uh, is if you do that and the EU makes tactical mistakes, well then you, you're, you're jumping off the boat uh, with a ball and chain linked to your uh, EU partner and you're both sinking because this is what happened in 
in Ochr. This uh, and I, Augustine alluded to this, and uh, uh, absolutely correct. Uh, I think Yovad also uh, mentioned this. this. This was a mistake to just declare victory in uh, the whole purpose of the Ochrid follow-up. The whole purpose of it was, okay, we are now going to have the detail to implement what was what was agreed nominally in Brussels, and they didn't do that. And not only did they not do that, they didn't address the lesser problem, Corinna. Let me, let's just get to where we are and why we're we're, oh, everyone is now, oh my gosh, this is terrible and, and look how dangerous and everything it is. Yes, because this was predictable. Everyone knew that the Coastal Service had already walked out of the institutions. Mm -hmm. the, 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 these elections had already been postponed mm -hmm. in, in, in Northern, and, and everyone knew that, that, there was, that they were gonna be run mm -hmm. by the time of Ochrid. So even if you didn't get all of this highest level detail about uh, Ogrid, which should have been agreed, the actual sequence for association and the reciprocal steps from Serbia, even if you couldn't manage that, the US and EU had to at least manage that, oh my gosh, we are not going to have a train wreck uh, next month. This was, remember, March 18th, elections were April 23rd, we are at least we are not going to have set up a train wreck there when these elections are held, and everyone could see what the, 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 Vucic had already said, and and what and he absolutely managed and, and went through uh, with the boycott, and uh, you you have this situation, and and then and Kosovo was told, look, you gotta you have to have uh, you, the polling stations this way, you can't use me, and and they, according to the U.S., they complied. With that, and, and, and what, of course, what they didn't comply, and, and Augustine is absolutely correct. They did. They then, at that point, uh, refused to, to comply. And Kurti refused to uh, uh, either to coordinate about deployment of special police in this operation to insert the mayors, and even to insert the mayors. And and of course, there is a wider backdrop here of the uh, of the intimidating. A presence of, of special police. And, and again, this is part of why this, this situation is so dangerous and the tensions are so high. But uh, just uh, again, I want to close. This decision on Alexander Vulin by the United States is quite significant. How far significant, we will see. But this is not just some oh, uh, token uh, gesture, oh, U.S. Treasury, you know, they, they do this. This is right. this is uh, uh, a quite uh, significant step. Right. Please. Thank you so much, Edward. Um, I want to encourage uh, our participants to uh, to ask, uh, to raise their hand at this point if they want to join our conversation with comments or questions. We do have one question that has been already raised. Uh, it comes from Gramos Mustafa, um, and he's actually asking about the German-French plan, which foresaw that the five non-recognizers, which... Uh, Edward just mentioned, would move is if Serbia refused the dialogue. Is this still in any way relevant or can be expected, he is asking. Um, I want to, um, to, to, to pose that question on the table and also because we talked about the, the situation um, as it is, as, as the, the way, the path that has led us to it, what lessons do we do we draw for the future now? What should be done at this point and who should be responsible for doing it? This is the question that I want to add in the mix. And um, when we're waiting to see if there's, yeah, there are actually two other questions. Um, maybe we'll take them because we're running out of time and then um, I'll come back for, uh, you can cherry pick among the different questions uh, for your uh, final answers. Daniel, Daniel Apostolovic, do you want to come in? Yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Great. Actually, uh, I would have some comments because uh, I Very have... Very briefly. Yes, I have the impression that, uh, I mean, I will stick, I mean, to the facts. I think that we are talking here about the consequences, but I will try to put in order the facts. The facts starting from Brussels agreement that was signed in 2013 and what Serbia has done and what the other side hasn't done so far. So regarding Serbia, you know that 
we did the integration of police, judges, prosecutors. We participated in local elections, participated in national assembly, in the government, while waiting the other side to establish community of Serbian municipalities. So uh, now uh, you are talking about uh, Ohrid agreement and stuff like that. But before talking about it, let's talk about the things that uh, uh, have been reached within the dialogue back in 2013. And it is not true that Serbia was not conditioned or blocked in, uh, uh, on its uh, accession talks, Mr. Palokai. We were conditioned all the time. You know, in order to get candidacy status, we had to sign two agreements. Uh, the agreement uh, uh, on uh, regional representation and on IBM back in 2011. Then in 2013, in order to, to get the uh, date uh, for the, for, to start the accession talks, we had to sign Brussels agreement. Then in order to start accession talks, we should implement Brussels agreement. So yes, I mean, we had progress and thanks to that progress assessed by European Commission and DAS, we uh, open uh, the chapters on our uh, EU path. Now we are blocked, actually blocked. Uh, we are not opening actually clusters because uh, uh, we uh, haven't introduced uh, uh, sanctions against Russia, but also in our negotiating framework, you know, it is stated, and this is uh, the, the legal document that we are supposed to have like progressive alignment. I know that the situation changed, but these are, let's say, the facts. I, I, I tried really to, to, to be- Yes, no worries, no worries. What I wanted to say actually is, we are talking now about the consequences. Let's go to the roots. Uh, right. Let's go to the to, to, to basics, to, to, to problems. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Berta, if it's a short question or comment, can you, can you speak now? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Please. Okay. Yeah, first, uh, thank you, uh, all the panelists for the super interesting insights. And then it, it's a really quick question. Giovanna was talking about the lack of um, reconciliation as like part of the agreement. And I would just like to ask, like, how do you think that this can be achieved now in the current like state of polarization uh, and so on? Like, how can um, reconciliation be achieved? And whether you think that this is a general trend across the region that there's a bit of uh, lack of uh, reconciliation and denial of the past in general. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Corina, you are muted. Oh, I'm... Jesus. Okay, there is uh, there is a further question linked to how Kosovo can get support for the, from the non-recognizing countries for NATO. Um, you have uh, we have quite a few uh, queries on the table please feel free to choose among those and react together with a little bit of forward thinking and practical thinking what do we where do we go from here to answer this uh, this 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 meetings um, a title um maybe who, who would like to go first um uh, okay let's go backwards edward you have the floor and then we we come back in the reverse well, and, and again I, I want I'm very much interested in in what uh my co-panelists have to say in answer but let, let me address daniel's very valid uh question here that, that uh and his comment actually that, that this was this was a obligation on the association back in 2013 again in 2015 we know of course that the constitutional court ruling in kosovo about this but uh, Daniel, fundamentally, it, it, it's completely valid to raise this. Of course, it's also valid to raise, we, we didn't discuss this, and uh, uh, I, I don't know if Augustine or, or others can point out uh, the, the detailed record of uh, aspects that Serbia did not comply with. So, uh, and, and my understanding, of course, uh, is that back in 2013, that there was the, the idea was that the association was would be done and and simultaneously there would uh, uh, be the end of the parallel structures so that, that there was a, an understanding of a reciprocal obligation so uh, I'll leave to Augustine or anyone else um, uh, Giovanna or, or Donica anyone else to to address those you know reciprocal yes. obligations and who did and who did not but there's a wider point here that I would like to uh, share with um, uh, Danielle and the others and this is in uh, my article that, that I uh, just wrote in foreign policy 
there again, the, the United States is creating a COSO crisis. That's the headline that FP gave it. The point I made is look at Ukraine and you will see the, the, the uh, inherent problem with the association. Uh, and it's a form of autonomy. And it's been, the word autonomy has been used, even Derek Chalet, who the, the uh, counselor to the US Secretary of State has used the term autonomy in, in conversations yesterday. Also the word autonomy, it's a form of autonomy that we can call it self-manager or whatever, but it's a form of autonomy. And if you look at Ukraine and you imagined that the US and EU said uh, to uh, President Zelensky, give the Russians autonomy, give the, the ethnic Russians, the Russian speakers in Donbass and Crimea, give them autonomy. That's what you need to do. We can call it self-management, but you need to give that to them. Zelensky, as I wrote, would immediately come back and say, well, will they, these Russian speakers, accept and, and recognize fundamentally that they live in Ukraine and not Russia, number one. Number two is, will Russia recognize our sovereignty and territorial integrity? And number three, if we make this grant of autonomy, will you finally let us into NATO, which is, which is what we want? And these are the exact same three questions that hover over this question of autonomy. In other words, yes, it was agreed in 2013, but it's also a fact that this is not just diplomas. Well, we're gonna recognize diplomas or, or some other facet. The, the grant of autonomy is all that a state like Ukraine or Kosovo has to give in this. It's, and I call this, that's why it's a final status issue. The, the grant of autonomy, the nature of that autonomy, that's what you give in, in, in exchange for final resolution of the issue. It's not an interim step. That's the point. It's not an interim step. It's not a confidence building measure. Hmm. It's not, well, we're gonna, you know, policing arrangements and diplomas and, and trade and things like that. Those are confidence building measures. This is not, this is all you have to give. And you have to remember again, this is a little, but my, my point about the, the nature of this, this isn't two parties at an equal level. One party, party X is privileged, is privileged because party X has four NATO and five EU countries on its side who, who, who say and condition their recognition on party X first move. So you have this imbalance and then you say, well, uh, even though you have this imbalance, you need to give the autonomy and that's, why this is inherent complicated. Now, let me quickly say for uh, Daniel or anyone else, does that mean Kosovo has no obligation to, to do the association? No, of course not. Kosovo is obligated. And this is what's striking here and why we shouldn't be so quick to just dismiss the Brussels and our program and say, oh, you know, this is all finished because Kurti accepted it. So uh, yes, we have this very serious problem with Vucic and then, you know, uh, not signing and immediately denying and so forth. But um, Forti accepted this, what he said he would never accept. And so he, there is this obligation. It's not something to just be tossed out and, and say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing here. And, and he did accept that. And this is, this is why the follow-on meeting in Okrit was so important to, to absolutely nail down, okay, Kosovo, you're gonna give this very important concession. Okay, Serbia, what are you going to do? And how are you going to uh, implement your obligations? And what is the sequence here that we're going yeah. to do? And this is, this is of course, where the, the US and EU uh, you know, obviously failed. And uh, the, there was a second question there, someone asked, you know, what about the other non-recognizers? That's a great question because there is no commitment. There, there, there is no commitment here. So Kosovo goes through and makes this, again, final status concession. It doesn't have any answers for those Zelensky questions. I call them the three Zelensky questions. And just put yourself, if you were, you know, President Zelensky, you wouldn't do it. Right. You wouldn't do it, even if you were sanctioned, even if you were pressured, you, you would you would be negotiating, you would be angling. And, and I finally, let me say that does not justify pressures uh, and, and uh, uh, this uh, uncoordinated deployment of special police 
and, uh, and, and pressures on the coastal service doesn't uh, justify any of that. It explains why this issue is so difficult. That's, yeah. that's what, it, what it does and why it's not just a simple matter of saying, oh, just do this association and everything will be fine. Thank, Thank you, you, Edward. Thank you. Augustine, um, tell us um, your answers to whatever question you want, but also try yeah. to, to tell us what should be done. Okay, uh, just to come back, uh, the first question was uh, whether it's still on the table French-German uh, proposal, which, uh, as Gramos said, uh, included the move from five non-recognizers. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, uh, to say that it was never on the table, this uh, mentioning of five non-recognizers that they would move if Serbia doesn't accept. It was other way around. Uh, they stick, most of them that they will move only if Serbia moves. So here I agree with uh, Edward, and this was also, I think, uh, uh, encouragement by uh, facilitators when they said that five non-recognizers will accept whatever Serbia accepts. Uh, this was at the very beginning of the Lychak mandate, which encouraged Serbia not to recognize. And as a result of that, we have, I called it a normalization of non-recognition. Uh, because uh, we have European Parliament, United States, Germany, most of the EU member states uh, saying publicly that uh, uh, the uh, agreement and uh, normalization should include uh, uh, the uh, mutual recognition. But this was dropped. And this document, this agreement, let's call it agreement, uh, it's uh, instead of agreement, it's agreement on the path towards normalization. So it's what rightly Mr. Borrell called it, it's a historical success, we have new status quo. While before that, they were always saying that status quo is not sustainable. So they moved from one status quo to another, and this one, even if it's successful, can last for 10 years. Uh, coming back to Daniel, I mean, uh, 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 he rightly said that Serbia is not moving in accession negotiations due to the lack of uh, support for sanctions against Russia. Yes, uh, alignment is uh, should go uh, gradually, progressively, but uh, this has uh, uh, to do with, for many other things in foreign policy. It was not meant to uh, choose between right and wrong, which the West and the, the, the free world called it um, uh, when it uh, speaks about the Russian aggression on Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, it's when I said that it's that in the, uh, uh, he rightly mentioned the conditions that Serbia had to do to get candidate status than to open accession negotiations. But since then, all the reports of those who monitor the progress on the normalization were positive about Serbia or even when they were questionable, they said that the progress of Serbia, compliance by Serbia was enough in order to go further. This was by European Commission and European External Action Service, and blockage came by member states, so not by EU uh, institutions. Uh, then uh, uh, I uh, am not sure whether uh, with uh, what uh, uh, Edward said about the mood in Kosovo, I mean, my impression from reading the media is that there is a huge feeling of uh, uh, injustice by EU because of the sanctions, even if they criticize Kurti. Of course, opposition is, is using this to blame Kurti, but uh, they would blame Kurti even if he would have listened to the European Union and United States, and they are already doing that. They only blame Kurti for not listening to Americans, but on the question, what would they do? They don't give a, a real answer. So uh, even here in Brussels, among the journalists and uh, uh, people who follow the dialogue, and even uh, diplomats uh, and even leaders from some member states, they have a feeling that uh, uh, this approach by European Union is not balanced because they are not disputing the right to take measures against Kosovo, but why they are not taking measures against Serbia because it was not that peaceful, empty-handed Serbs managed to wound 93 NATO soldiers. Huh? This is, uh, it is clear. And uh, I'm pretty sure following, uh, uh, covering NATO for years and European Union, I'm pretty sure that EULEX and uh, NATO, they have very, very clear picture who does what in the North for years. And here also, I think that it's, bit of illusion to believe that Serbia really implemented everything and Kosovo did not implement the main thing, which is association. 
and uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a logical question and uh, uh, to ask whether the parallel structures were really really integrated in the system of Kosovo because whoever went in the north and who lived there they know that this was not fully true because they were parallelly linked uh, both to Kosovo institutions but also to Belgrade and uh, uh, we saw this because uh, many many moves of the Lista Srpska basically but other structures in the north were coordinated by Belgrade and coming to this um, uh, quite often Leitchak mentions association as a, and, you know, and Americans as well and here they say that the, there are 16 or so European models and when I ask them is there any European model when an uh, ethnic uh, community has an association or sp uh, special status in a country that they don't recognize uh, or I have never seen or heard the uh, Germans from Belgium where I live saying uh, uh, that our government in Berlin or we want the support of uh, German soldiers to save us here in Belgium and so on. So, and it's a, a also legitimate question by Kosovo to ask what Kosovo gets for association. They will not accept that let's make first association and then we will see what next. So they, uh, that's why I, I have some hope and from tomorrow they will clarify steps and sequencing what which part has to do when and what one part gets if another part uh, doesn't. So uh, here uh, I think that uh, uh, if European Union facilitators with the support of uh, uh, member states can impose on, the, on, on both sides uh, 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 their duties and to have serious approach, not to pretend because I, I look, Leitchak uh, got a job because he is expert for the region and here if he believes that uh, uh, President Vucic doesn't have impact on the Kosovo Serbs, then he is not expert. Sorry to say that. So, and uh, only one issue that I can confirm that United States uh, for years are working on a kind of autonomy for the Serbs in the north. We heard this, I mean, I can even quote a senior diplomat from 10 years ago saying that we need for the north something that does not start with A, that is not called autonomy, but it's not called Ahtisari. So something more than Ahtisari and less than autonomy, but with different names because Kosovo Albanians don't want to hear about autonomy while the Serbs don't like the word Ahtisari. So to find something that starts, that doesn't start with A. And uh, uh, I guess that the association is product of this logic, but here also uh, uh, they have to make clear because what was once called constructive ambiguity became now destructive ambiguity. Because if you leave ambiguous things to both sides to interpret in the way that they want, then you have trouble. Correct. You cannot be ambiguous whether Kosovo has a right to send special units in the north or not. If you leave this to interpretation, then you have problems. Yeah. So now I think asking what should be done, association should be created and it should be created clearly within the mandate uh, if United States really want to push, they insist that it should be created based on the Kosovo constitution and EU should not be ambiguous about it, saying uh, Leitchak in Pristina that yes, it should be implemented based on the Kosovo constitution and the ruling of constitutional court and the same day in Belgrade saying that constitution is not Bible and constitution can be changed. So they have to be clear, right. not only what association should be, but what should not be. Because when Kosovo and some others uh, say that uh, it should be, we, don't, we will not allow Republika Srpska model in Kosovo, Serbs don't say that, no, no, it will not be. But they, they say, and Vucic repeated it two days ago, what's wrong with Republika Srpska? So it's not only how Kosovo understands it, how European Union understands, but also how Serbia Absolutely. and Serbs will understand it. So here we need a real sincere clarification from all sides and then to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. Yeah, Jovana, very briefly, if, if you would. Where to start? No, I want to start from the ambiguity. And I think this is the actually the the biggest problem with the, the entire normalization process. Because uh, if you have uh, so much agreements and so much deals that were signed or not signed, 
that in the end creates uh, a different interpretation from Belgrade or from Pristina, in the end, the only people that are not feeling any kind of change are the people who are living in Kosovo now, whether it's a, it's a, on, on the north or anywhere else. So basically uh, what um, I'm trying to say is that the positions from Belgrade and for Pristina are quite different in this um, negotiations because Belgrade is leaning towards the normalization of the relations and Pristina is leaning toward, towards the recognition, which is the, the which is basically then speaking of the different things in the entire process. And this is the main reason why uh, it is problematic to actually reach any kind of um, um, successful, let's say, uh, right. agreement. So basically, uh, my, I mean, the only, the only, if only if we have specifically um, named things that are supposed to be done, this is, and who is supposed to do it, whether it's a Belgrade or Pristina or jointly, then we will know that um, actually there is a progress or there is no progress. Um, if we are speaking of the, of the um, reconciliation issue that, that I mentioned, um, I mean, in, in my opinion, there are three scenarios that can go from here. One is to upkeep the, the status quo, which is something that is happening currently. So we will have escalations and de-escalations of the problem of the situation in the in the north, mainly. Uh, whenever there is a, a specific issue that Belgrade or Pristina don't want to deal with. So this is like we have the, the they have the power to actually create um, any kind of disturbance um, in the north. Uh, second option is the de-escalation and uh, a, a proper dedication to the implementation of the agreed agreements. I will confirm, I mean, and, and have to disagree that this will not be uh, legal, uh, legally binding for the sides, especially because Serbia signed the SAA uh, and afterwards uh, there is actually uh, an uh, agreement uh, connection between the between Serbia and uh, the EU and everything uh, that is coming out for our negotiation uh, framework. If we want to upkeep the path towards the EU, uh, it, it is actually uh, legally binding for for Serbia. So transposing the agreements into our uh, negotiation framework will be very um obligatory for the country and uh, um, as augustin actually mentioned the beside the chapters 23 and 24 which does not include the 31 concerning the the uh, relation towards towards russia thir chapter 35 can be used to stop the negotiations and if the eu wants and this is where we come again um, uh, whether the response of the EU is adequate and timely when, when it's supposed to come. Okay. Um, in the end, uh, the third model, which I would like to see, is that we have the... Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention that if we want the second one, I think we probably need to have a different uh, negotiators, uh, which is also something that is um, necessary for the third model. And this is the one that includes the reconciliation and that would actually um, um, request the negotiators that will have uh, good gestures and um, let's say um, to show goodwill that they are dedicated to the process of normalization and reconciliation and i don't know for example have meeting in uh, in uh, in Bujanovac or have meeting in mitrovica together and maybe visit someone who is idp or returnee or whatever and I do believe that we are quite far away from this kind of scenarios, but I would like to see them one day. Thank you so much, uh, Yovana. Doniga, you have the final two minutes uh, at your disposal. Please try to stick to it. I have been part of so many panels with EPC, so I, I will take it. I will be as brief as possible. Well, I mean, uh, it starts with Gramos' question. It was never part of the German-French dial. Uh, 
uh, process or, or plan. It was basically a wishful thinking of Kurti and a request towards Lychak. He had some meetings in, you know, five not recognizers. Capitals had managed to do nothing, which brings me to uh, Merita's question, uh, whether the EU is credible. I mean, from the Kosovo side, if you give the fact that, you know, obviously there is not much that is being done and Kosovo has been sanctioned, but also uh, cannot guarantee anything on the five non recognizers, this credibility is basically on the floor. Uh, and uh, also this, you know, pairs with power is asymmetry, which has been mentioned by Edward for so many times. There is another question on NATO. And uh, yeah, we still need the f four non-recognizers in that case. And obviously, Kosovo is intentions and embracing now this country, which is very, you know, potential co conflict zone in the future. It will be very, uh, you know, kind of strategic steps with NATO, which NATO member states have to think quite a lot in order to, to, to make that step toward Kosovo. There is Tevta's question on the association, which leads to also Daniel's uh, comments. I mean, with understanding how the situation went, obviously both parties implemented something, but also failed to implement most of the things. Uh, and uh, what, what I believe that is, you know, what Ed said, this Ohrid and Brussels 2023 are important because Kurdi has agreed to the association, but of course, I am sure that he wants to know in exchange of what. So this leads me to the next steps. The next steps is that Kurti tried to draft a statute which and agreed to implement it. So if he does, then what is he getting out of it? The next steps are for the EU to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the recognition and not normalization, because you cannot have normalization without having this question resolved. I mean, we spent 10 years of doing so and we to do it. So, you know, we talk about, we stop, you know, hoping that incremental approach will bring us to something. We ditch ambiguity because obviously it led us to tensions. It didn't work. So stop, you know, trying this, the same experiment, hoping for different results. They're not going to be happening. So not ambiguous, a lot of diplomatic capital, not in just signing and agreeing, but implementing. And this is something that the UN, US have to do if they guarantee that you know this agreement is going to be signed to make sure that it's going to be implemented and it's also have a time bound uh negotiations not like borrell say like oh we signed something and this opens a new negotiation chapter how long and you know what are the concrete steps otherwise i'm going to speak in many other panels about this and i'm not going to be happy about it mm, right Thank you, Danica. Um, a very complex situation. Uh, there are ideas. Um, there's responsibility on all sides for more commitment and more serious work and delivery, above all, uh, for some strategic thinking also on the part of the EU and the US, um, and, and obviously clarity of language. Tomorrow, as Augustine says, um, it's another day, and hopefully, uh, it's uh, it, it it will mark the turning point that uh, that Donica says. It's a conversation that uh, we plan to um, to continue having. Thank you so much for your insights, uh, for your patience, also to to our participants. I know that there was there were many more questions uh, lined up, but we are already twenty minutes over the time limit, so I will have to close here. But with the premise that we will reconvene and we will continue to discuss hopefully about better momentum in in this situation and about a better situation on the ground uh, and in this um, uh, dispute thank you very much a wonderful afternoon a great day add to you in the united states um, and looking forward to um, uh, our next event bye bye thank you, thank you.